So we are. Thank you, Ms. Lord. Call the meeting to order. Council and committee. And we remind you that we're being webcast. And so speak up and smile for the camera. Comb over your bald spot if you're sitting with your back to it. And uh, I would ask to, as we do now at Council and committee, does anyone have any other business to add to the agenda? I have one. For Council and committee? Yep. Okay. Give it a two-word title. Pardon? Can you give it a two-word title? Yeah, it's it's a Charles Best uh, uh, School of the Turf. Thank you. Others? <coughs> Thank you very much. First item on the agenda. Okay. First item, our minutes of the Council Committee meeting held Monday, April 15th. Recommendations that the committee approve those minutes. So moved. Second. By Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor O'Neill. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Item two is a report regarding the Fortis BC Community Giving Day. We've introduced comments by our General Manager of Parks, Recreation, and Culture Services. Thank you, Ms. McKay. You must pass the mic back, Lord. You can just pass the mic back. Just pass the mic back to you. Will you just sit down? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is an information report to uh, share with Council that Coquitlam has been awarded the Fortis BC 2013 Community Day of Giving. On Saturday, June 15th, Fortis BC staff and their families are volunteering to deliver a lasting charitable public amenity in Coquitlam. The project is the creation of a new community garden in Town Centre Park, adjacent to the Inspiration Garden um, at the corner of Pipeline Road there, uh, with raised garden plots and a hoop house. And you can see the attachment that's to your report there on the overhead uh, slide. Fortis BC donates $30,000 for materials and supplies, as well as the sweat equity of as many as 120 50 Fortis employees and their families for the day to contribute to building our community while Fortis build enduring pride and team spirit for their company. We have learned that many Fortis BC families call Coquitlam and the Tri-City area home and enthusiasm for this project is very high in the company. The community garden will be available to local gardeners for a modest membership fee. Uh, approximately thirty to fifty dollars uh, a year. The raised planter beds will have a range of heights to accommodate various mobility needs, and the hoop house will allow for an expanded range of plants that can be grown in our climate zone. And that element is uh, rather a unique feature that uh, this community garden will have over the other community gardens uh, that are available in uh, the metro area. Can you tell us what a hoop house looks it like? Different from a greenhouse. Uh, it could be called a greenhouse. Um, it, it's uh, made with uh, basically plastic with acrylic panels on, on the side, so it's not a permanent structure. So just like a hoop? Just like a big hoop. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. <laughs> used to call them quotes, I thought. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Similar to the Perquitlam Community Garden, this <clears throat> garden will focus on our organic food production with no pesticides, and a share of production will go to our local food banks. Council is invited to join Fortis BC on June the 15th to participate in the Community Day of Giving. Just like our iconic beef sculpture in the Inspiration Garden, the site will be a beehive of activity that day until the work is done and the volunteers celebrate before turning this new amenity over to the people of Coquitlam. That concludes my introductory remarks. Thank you, Lori. But Brent, then me, then Lou, then Terry. Well, I, I want to thank staff, thank Fortis BC, for this. I, I think it's an excellent addition to the Inspiration Gardens as presently there. And the Inspiration Gardens has been quite the addition to that corner. There's a bit of, from Council, not sure if they were for it or not over the years, but it's really turned out to be quite the addition there. And with all these beds here now, there's going to be, I guess, a first come, first serve to get a plot. And is there a time limit on the plots? Like, for re-registering or once you have it, you have it as long as you pay your money. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, through the chair, um, there'll be 40 outdoor plots and about t uh, 12 to 15 indoor plots that will be on a first come, first served uh, basis, and we expect uh, interest to be very high as it is at the Burquitlam Community Garden and other community garden um, sites throughout the metro area. Um, we are planning at this stage for the membership to be a, an annual membership um, and we'll work with volunteers around um, the rules and regulations around membership. It, it can often be challenging because for many gardeners, once they get their plot, they want to invest in it with adding soil amendments and, and so on, and they might want that particular plot in, in the ongoing years. So typically we've seen in community gardens where there's a balance, where some sites are allowed to um, have first refusal rights for the next season if they're interested, whereas others are available only for one year and then it's turned over on a first come first serve basis. But we'll be looking to work with our volunteers in the Inspiration Garden to come up with a good balance of availability um, for the range of different gardeners that we have in the city. <coughs> No, it's a, it's a great thing, I, and I, I thank Portis and staff for working together to qualify for the 30000 and it'll be a nice amendment, uh, addition to the city, especially within this area, that there's a lot of people in the rise looking for it in gardening. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. I'm going to take myself off, but go to Lou. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a great, uh, certainly a good report. Uh, I support it. The one thing that it's going to be Coquitlam people, uh, mainly, they'll be getting first choice. As in any of our um, programs in the city, we availability is on a first come first serve basis, and we don't screen by a residency. Um, we do find overwhelmingly it is local Coquitlam um, citizens that are registering for all of our programs. So we we do expect that our local uh, people will take the available spots first. Yeah, I, I'd have great problems if there's a lineup of Coquitlam people would like it, and and then somebody from Vancouver or Burnaby or Richmond takes the one. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm totally opposed to that. I think, I think that we should really support Coquitlam people. It's going to be Coquitlam employees are going to be employed there or, or working, doing a certain amount of work. And uh, certainly the money was granted to Coquitlam, so I'd hope that it's Coquitlam people only. But I'd like to have seen, you know, I mean, I'd like to have seen that thing carry over, you know, where we have that fancy kind of, uh, work on a corner there. I mean, that thing was five hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars that we put in to, to build it to begin with. And then I don't know what it's costing us on a yearly basis to maintain it. And I think that you know what, expanding that to that area would be great because I can tell you something: five hundred fifty thousand dollars outside of the people that live where I live on a fourth floor may be able to see it. But uh, you know, but certainly you know. Uh, I think it was a great expenditure of taxpayers' money and something that, and I understand that if I'm, I may be correct or I may be wrong, but I hear that that bumblebee that's there on a yearly basis is $25,000. Now, you know, I mean, if we're spending on a bumblebee every year, 25000 I've got great difficulty, you know. So, you know, it may not be true. Maybe that bumblebee is being stored on a yearly basis. Okay. Wherever it is. But anyways, you know, so those are those are my comments. I think that you know what? It's a great program, but as I said, we've got to save a hell of a lot of money and we've done many other things, maybe maybe improve some of the boulevards in the city as far as green education is concerned instead of that corner. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sakura. Ms. McKay, did you want, did you have some information for Councillor Sakura? Um, initial sculpture of the, the bee at the, at the flower, there was a cost associated with the, the initial fabrication. I would have to go into our files to find out what that initial fabrication cost was, but on an on annual basis, it is not, doesn't represent a significant uh, expense at all. We use volunteers to plant up the, the bee each year. You might remember from our Canada Day festivities, that's always a very popular activity where people will come and plant up uh, that uh, environmental sculpture. So the only costs are really just the plant materials that are purchased uh, whole, wholesale and uh, the sculpture itself is reused uh, each year. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Councillor Sikora raised an interesting issue about the um, exclusivity of usage, limiting that to uh, Coquitlam residents. That's something I hadn't considered. Um, this is fairly close to Port Coquitlam. He named a lot of other cities where people might come from, but I think it's it'd likely be Port Coquitlam. Uh, we're quite close to Port Coquitlam in that area there. So uh, there might be something to think about, to maybe not exclusively limiting it to just Coquitlam, <coughs> but uh, limiting the percentage of people from outside of Coquitlam um, that might use it. So to make sure that the two-thirds or so of Coquitlam anyway, because we do have good relationships with our neighbors. We use their facilities uh, as well as I was using their Poco Trail over the weekend. Um, quite enjoyed it. Um, so, but this is a, these sorts of gardens are very uh, popular and we do want to make sure that the primary benefit is for Coquitlam residents. Um, I have a question about the financial implications. You mentioned a $50 annual fee that, for membership in this. Um, is, that, is that right in your oral presentation? I expressed a range of um, 30 to $50 oh, per okay. year. So um, the operating expenses will be covered by garden membership fees, which is the 30 to $50, and program revenues. So what other revenues are, gonna, are there going to be other than the membership fees? Because the program revenues is on page three of the written report. There's uh, expenses to be covered by garden membership fees and program revenues. Are we going to be selling sponsorships or something? Thank you for the question. Um, the city is always interested in exploring sponsorships and, and gifts for parks, and we uh, will certainly use this uh, amenity as an opportunity to stimulate more donors that may want to uh, participate. We can also anticipate uh, opportunities for instructional programs um, happening. We already have uh, programs in the Inspiration Garden, and people can register in terms of learn to garden, learning organic, um, gardening practices, for example, um, and topics of interest um, and related to horticulture. So we can imagine those programs expanding with the expansion of, of the site, and that has the potential to generate some program revenues to offset costs. Okay, thank you. And I'd just like to conclude by saying this is uh, a wonderful project, and uh, congratulations to Fortis for uh, select uh, for for making this sort of program available. Wise and, choice. Yeah, wise and, and for making such a wise <laughs> choice. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, ditto to Fortis. Um, I'm glad to see my tax dollars, my gas tax dollars, going somewhere nice, like feeding my bumblebee. That's good. Um, the thirty to fifty dollar fee is that not high for those? A lot of the folks that may be in the garden, and I don't know this for a fact, but maybe they're there because um, this sort of helps subsidize their food budget through the year, and is that a little high? Thank you for the question. In looking at uh, fees, we're looking generally at membership fees for similar not-for-profit community garden um, okay. operations throughout Metro, Metro, and they tend to be in that range, and that really is seen as a low cost that goes to provide the basics of maintaining the site, knowing that all the labor on the site is um, the, the gardeners themselves. But there are some utility fees in terms of bringing water in and for the, uh, the hoop house that it will also have uh, power and gas, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, so there are some very modest expenses in the operation of, of the site. Um, the size of the plots normally for community garden plots uh, is limited throughout uh, Metro and isn't enough to have a, a, a garden size that could sustain a whole um, family's food um, requirements in a year. Yes, the food that is produced at these gardens do supplement um, people's groceries um, for the season you know, that we have here in Vancouver, um, but primarily the participation for many of the gardens is for people who have a passion for gardening and wish to grow um, food or herbs or whatever their interests are but don't have the land because they're in apartments or condominiums and their patio size, if they're on the wrong side of the building, they don't get the sun or whatever and they just have limited ability to um, participate in, in the gardening that, that they enjoy. So the short answer is um, you feel it's... It's dirt cheap. It's reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheap dirt. <laughs> that is the short answer. And I could dig a hole and put you in it. <laughs> 
less than a dollar a week. See if you grow. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing, Laurie, I really feel it's important as well to have this offer to Coquitlam residents because when we did the first community garden, um, it was just a real novelty to me. I thought it was really cool and all the folks would walk and come and plant all the different things and you can go and ask dumb questions like I do. I have the original pair of black thumbs. So it's kind of fun to actually see things grow. Um, <clears throat> but I really think it should be for Coquitlam residents. And you know, it's not like it's not like a big pool or a big ice rink or something where all the cities can't afford to do this. All the cities, no matter who they are, can afford to have community gardens. So I, I really think it should be a neighborhood thing. And uh, I'm pretty proud of this one, so I would uh, like to see some more of them. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I have Craig and Lou, but I notice, I think a, a delegation from Portis has come to borrow shovels from Rory. Uh, thank, Ms. McKay. thank you, Mr. Chair. And Amy, um, hi. Uh, the welcome to Portis, BC. Thank you for coming. And I wonder, Amy, if you could introduce uh, your delegation. Sure, I would like to. Into the microphone? Yes, please. We're being webcast. Are we? You can actually come up to the table. Yeah, no, come up here. Come up to the table and you'll be on camera. All right, so um, if everybody could just stand up. We've got in the back, um, Joan Isaac is here, Carmela Devine, Leslie Christoph, and Roger Bello. And so these are part of the core committee that, um, that put on these days. We're very, very happy to be working with Coquitlam this year for the Portis BC Community Volunteer Day. It's actually our sixth. Um, we ha are becoming more practiced. Um, um, we started in 2008 in Surrey. We built an uh, indigenous garden at Holland Park. And the next year we were in Richmond at the um, Sharing Farm. And the next year after that we worked with um, Aboriginal Tourism Association of BC at Klahalia Village. Um, again, the next year we were back in Delta at a community um, garden again, and last year we worked with the city of Abbotsford. We actually built um, amphitheater style seating for their BMX park. It was a bit more of a heavy lifting day. Um, but we um, expect to have more than 100 employees come out and, and help to make your vision a reality. We're seeing um, a hoop house, and Roger was one of the team that um, built a hoop house in Delta, so we do have some experience there. He's taken the book home to study it. And, um, oh, and great. we're looking at, I think, about 40 raised beds, and um, we're very, very happy to, to be working with you on this. This does come, our employees sweat at equity with a donation for $30,000 to go with it. That's great. great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Maurice is here. He's good at rebar if Roger needs help. <laughs> That's right. And Maurice has built almost everything. <laughs> Maybe not almost. Maybe month, but <laughs> thank you very much. You, you arrived in time to miss a number of the thanks that were given around okay. the table, but there are yeah. a couple of people left to speak. We have so. to pull it up on the web. <laughs> yeah. like that. That's right. Well, it'll be archived. You can, you can play it for the board. Thank some you. Event. Thank you. I have, the, I have the privilege of being able to speak after you arrive, so uh, I too will begin by uh, thanking uh, Forrest, and this time I get, a, I get to the opportunity to thank you in person. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great program. We appreciate the, the donation and certainly the, uh, the, the work that's, that's going to go along with, with making this a, a reality. I think this is something that the community is going to uh, embrace. Um, I had the opportunity actually just uh, on Saturday to, uh, or yesterday on Sunday, to attend the opening of the new one that's just been opened up on uh, Burke Mountain, up on the, the ranch, uh, Shifting Growth, I uh, worked with Westville to put one in, and uh, it was great to see the entire community out there and little kids who had probably never uh, planted a seed before, they were out digging and, and planting their gardens, and, uh, and raised gardens, so I can sort of visualize uh, that this is probably going to look very, very similar, and, uh, and certainly I'd like to see more of these around the city. I, I certainly like the idea that we're um, 
going to uh, do the uh, the no pesticide. We're going to be able to support the food bank, and uh, and I, I am aware of the educational programs that we currently run there. And I think this is a great opportunity to expand those programs and to uh, and especially in an area here where we're seeing more and more apartments. Uh, that this is a chance for kids to actually come out and and uh, and the residents in that area to come out and be involved in uh, in gardening, and not only to learn where food comes and how it's grown, but also to have a chance to uh, to participate in the in the food production in the in the community so uh, I, I think this is a, a win for uh, for everybody and it's certainly a win for uh, the citizens of Coquitlam and then once again thank you to uh, Fortis for their uh, for their contribution thanks thank you Craig Councillor Scora yeah thank you very much how big are these plots as big as this room half this room Six by three with a what depth of 18 inches. Six feet six by, by three, three feet, feet by three with three a depth feet. of 18 feet three feet. inches. Uh, about the size of this tabletop, one of these tables. Uh, yeah. yeah, and raised up. Yeah. And Anyways, were up and through. Uh, and then, then, you know, I know, I'll tell you what, about $50 for something the size of this small little table here. That's a, you know what, I think they didn't spend $50 buying that produce in the store wouldn't cost them fifty dollars for you what they can you charge three thousand down at robinson i mean i was born on a farm <laughs> i'm second youngest out of 15 kids and we had 10 acres of farm of garden so i can talk about gardening we planted a lot of things and you know about the size of this we didn't feed one person in, in a year you know so fifty dollars a little steep and you know i i, I think it should be all coquette people i i support for coquette port moody using our eyes, using the swimming pools and everything else, definitely, and we do the same thing with them. We go back and forth, use their fields, we use our fields. I'm fully supportive of that, but something like this, I don't think you can afford to give it out to the whole community, to other communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Spor. I'll just comment that <clears throat> six by three is as much as I would want to garden. <laughs> uh, times, times change and Gardening like housing density is the answer. Recropping re, re throughout the year. It's not a matter of taking one crop off and going home. Can I get a motion to receive the motion? So moved. moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Eismondson. Further discussion? All in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Fortis. People from Fortis are welcome to stay for the exciting rest of the committee meeting. <laughs> But if you want to go and get your shovels now, that'll be okay. There's lots of outdoor stuff anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Item three is a report regarding the Monday Park Interpretive Walk, Scan and Discover. We have introductory comments to our General Manager of Parks, Recreation and Culture Services and a presentation by the Urban Forestry and Park Services Manager. Yeah. Chair, I have a few comments uh, before I turn it over to Lanny England, our Urban Forestry and Park Services Manager, who has a brief on-screen presentation uh, for this item today. Uh, this is an information report to share with Council about a pilot project for a self-guided interpretive walk in Monday Park using new smartphone technology and QR tags. It introduces innovation to meet the changing needs of park visitors, especially the growing population of park visitors using mobile devices, and presents more dynamic, interpretive content of interest to park visitors to expand the park experience at a much lower cost than traditional printed physical signage. The program will be launched on May 1st with signs in the park explaining how the QR tags work and information on the city's website and through social media. Staff will evaluate the pilot based on public feedback and the number of times the QR tags are scanned to provide insight on the value of this initiative and potential for similar projects uh, in the future. I'll turn it over now to Lanny, but uh, also just highlight that on Wednesday we do have a tour um, that many councillors are taking advantage of, the ones that are available, and on Wednesday you'll have the opportunity to see the interpretive signage, uh, a bit of a preview um, on Wednesday. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lanny. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. All right. Thanks, Larry. And uh, so actually this Wednesday, the day of the trail tour, <coughs> is the day that um, this new project goes live. <coughs> so thanks for... Microphone. Oh. Thanks. 
so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to highlight this uh, new initiative that Parks, Rec, and Culture staff have been working with uh, corporate communication staff on launching, which again will go live this Wednesday. So this should be a pretty brief presentation, probably about five, six minutes. So in this presentation, um, we'll be going through just explaining what a QR tag is or a QR code is. And then I'll be showing you what the signage looks like. It'll be going up in the park and showing, then showing you a map of where these, sign in, these signs will be on the trail system in Mundy Park. And then just giving you, giving you a preview of just a little bit of the content that you'll, you'll find out there. So what is a QR tag? So a QR tag or quick response code is a matrix barcode, and you'll see examples of it later in the presentation uh, that you can scan if you have a, the appropriate app with a mobile device, including uh, all sorts of brands of smartphones, iPhones, Android, or Blackberry. And once the code is scanned, it'll redirect you to a particular web page. In this case, it'll redirect you to pages on the city's mobile website. So our Scan and Discover Walk is using these QR codes. And uh, so we've used this system to create an interpretive walk throughout the park that'll highlight um, all range of different information for park users to access, including ecological information, history of Mundy Park, um, highlighting some wildlife species. And it, because this technology is uh, web-based and utilizes smartphone technology, not only will we be able to provide text-based information, but also images, sound, video. So this slide highlights the signage that will be going up in the park, so the physical manifestation of this uh, project that will be um, launched on Wednesday. So on the left, the scan and discover sign is what people will see on the kiosk throughout the park, so it's the introductory sign to explain what it's all about. Uh, and uh, for people who have a device but may not have one of these applications, it explains what to do to go about getting one of them so you can access this information. And on the right is just an example of what the small signs that are scattered throughout the park uh, will look like that actually people scan and it will give them the site-specific interpretive information. They're only about five inches by four inches on a, on a, on a wooden post. And this is an example of a map that we've taken that's straight off the mobile website. So this map Every time somebody scans one of the QR codes throughout the park, this map will come up in addition to the content. So they'll be able to see where they are in the park in relation to the other locations where they'll find this content and also just the trail system itself. So it also functions as a, uh, another map to navigate the park. So just to highlight a few of the bits of information that people will get if they happen to participate in this walk. Um, so some of the historic information pictured here is uh, George Mundy, so the uh, original owner of the land and the namesake of the park. Um, an example here of some of the ecological information, highlighting uh, one species of tree that you'd find in the park, Pacific yew tree, and some interesting facts about it and the fact that it, uh, cancer fighting drugs have been isolated uh, utilizing that, that tree, or that species of tree, not that particular tree of course. <laughs> and, um, and then here's an example of some of the wildlife information that people will find. Um, so we have endangered species in Mundy Park. Pictured here is the western painted turtle, so that's some information that people will receive if they um, scan the right QR code. And on the owl trail in Mundy Park, one of our stops highlights some of the owl species that are resident in Mundy Park. And in addition to showing photos of these owl species, it has the, the calls there as well, so you can see what they look like and also hear their call. It's pretty common to hear different wildlife species in the park but not see them, so it's nice to have that link. So there's 12 different stops. These are just little bits of information from some of those stops. And this is my last slide. So just highlighting again, Lori did a great job of introducing it. This is a pilot project to utilize this new technology that uh, integrates multimedia with uh, park interpretive information in a low cost and flexible way. But uh, being a pilot project, we want to take the time to, um, to get some feedback from people. So in addition to the fact that we can actually track how many people access this information, which is something you can't do with traditional hard copy signs, we'll be uh, collecting that data. That happens automatically through the software system. We'll see how many people are using it. But we've also got these three questions that are an optional survey that come up when people scan the code on the scan and discover signs on the kiosks. 
So if they choose to, they, they can give us some feedback in terms of what they thought of uh, the interpretive walk. And we'll use that information in helping us uh, make a determination in the future if we want to implement something like this on another park site. Thank you. I have everybody. <laughs> May, Terry, Lou, Brent, Craig. Okay. <clears throat> I, I think in this day and age, this is a great thing to do, but I think there also has to be some signage as well. I mean, we've got some, and I think we have to keep it updated. But what I wanted to know is if we can use this useful little tool for a couple of um, different things. One, is there some kind of a link that can go right to bylaws for off-leash dogs <laughs> running through the parks? And two, is there some kind of a link that could um, advise our wildlife coordinator if people spot bears, bears with cubs, or coyotes, which are two things, we're, I think, things that we're trying to track in our park and try and figure out where they go. Because if we have all these folks out, you know, going through the trails and the parks and that, it might be worthwhile to Drake to know that people see a mom and, and some cubs in Scott Creek, but nowhere else in the city or in Mundy Park and nowhere else in the city or stuff like that. Um, I would like to know if it can be used for that as well, if we're trying to use it just for interpretive purposes. <clears throat> All right. Well, I, I'm not speaking from the perspective of an expert in uh, um, the website or, or this or this technology, but it does link a QR, a unique QR code can be generated to go to any web page. So if the city's website had locations like that where people could report those sorts of things, it could jump there. But I, um, I'm not sure about the implementation of that, how that would well, work. Well, you've got these survey questions. So what if there was another one that um, off-leash dog, press one, uh, bear, press two, coyote, press three, bear with cubs, press four, something like that? Because I, I think that's useful information for us. I really do. So I just want to know. No? I, I would have to say that, in theory, there's lots of things that could be done with this technology, and those would probably be included. Well, if, I, if I'm going to pay for it, I mean, let's use it wisely. Mr. McDonald. The way it's configured right now, it isn't really set for what I would call interactive okay. information going back and forth. That would be sort of jumping into another realm. Okay. Um, that would require... A technology and B, uh, someone to be there to actually answer the question. So this is meant to be uh, what I would consider to be passive information at this stage, but it does, anything's possible. Yeah. I didn't expect someone to be on the other line to answer when someone sees a bear or that, but I would like to know where they are in the community, and I, I think that's pretty useful information, unless you just want to hire somebody else to go out and spend a hundred grand a year counting them. Thank you. Thank you, May. Terry? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I really like this program. Um, I think it um, has the potential to be uh, really engaging. Um, however, um, um, I asked the um, technology experts in our family about the use of QR codes, and they quite correctly, because I verified what they said right off the top of their head, noted that QR codes generally in the last several years haven't caught on as well as um, people have had hoped, um, great new technology that people really haven't embraced, but maybe we haven't, maybe the users of it haven't found exactly what it's good for. Maybe this is what it's going to be good for. Um, I think there's been a lot of marketing opportunities that people have tried to take advantage of, people trying to sell products and things like that, and that hasn't been embraced. This is something different, and uh, as you said, sort of a passive thing, and um, so um, I'm hopeful that, uh, that it will work. Um, and I'd also like to alert uh, the uh, general manager of planning that we have a signage report coming up in number six in this afternoon's committee meeting, and uh, we might want to talk about that in conjunction with the, that signage issue as well. So if you weren't paying attention to the QR code thing, I want to let you <laughs> pay attention to it now. And with a, a nod to the uh, graphic that... Uh, that these QR codes are going to be put into. I have to say that I'm happy that the, uh, that the department is uh, turning over a new leaf and embracing this new technology. Oh. Thank you. Oh. 
Well, if you think that was a stretch, just wait. Okay, are oh, you got one coming? No, okay. no, I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Sikor? Yeah, thank you very much. I got mixed feelings about this one. Really have, and I'll tell you, I'll just name some of those things. Number one, vandalism. And we thought about it. It can disappear as, as fast as you put them up. Okay? Uh, anyways, you're talking about pilot project. How much is this pilot project going to cost us? So the, uh, the, the materials themselves, as well as the installation, cost about $3,500. Okay, and you know, the thing is now, yeah. you, you mentioned in here, costly to produce and install. You know, I mean, can you, I, I don't know what this price tag is going to be throughout Monday Park. I mean, what is it going to be? Sky is not the limit with our budget. You know, uh, we, we've got here no financial implications in here whatsoever, and everybody likes it. Well, I might like it too, to a certain extent, but I do need to know a budget on a yearly basis to operate it, uh, to install it, what is it going to cost, and if it's costly to produce and install, I got, I got really difficulty because you know what? The government can be doing so many things, and we always seem to want to put a stick of government into people's faces that I'm totally opposed to. I think less government, the better off we are. We're, you know, we're not going to keep track of somebody walking through, through Monday Park. It's been there for, for hundreds of years. It's going to be there for hundreds of years. People are, people are going to be walking for it. Now I'm going to keep track of the flies and the bees and, the, and every damn thing else in there. I mean, you know, we're just going too bloody far. Really are. We're coming, I don't know, we must be sitting in some room and, and, and I'm sorry for saying this, but thinking of ideas, how we can spend taxpayers' money. You know, and, and this to me, uh, until I know what the cost of it is, what's it going to cost on a yearly basis to, to, to operate it, and the vandalism on it, and a few other things, I can't support it. I can't support it, sorry. Those are things I, I must know. If I think for one minute they're going to prove this and something else is going to fall off the budget, that may be good for sports people mm -hmm. that they can use in that type of deal, then they got great difficulty, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sikora. Well, we're not being asked to approve it. We're being asked to receive a report that's about and then next one, of, one of the, excuse me, one of the small ways in which staff have decided to use some of the budget that we have allocated to them. I suspect that we might spend a good deal more money on signage, which would be at a great deal greater risk of vandalism. But I will leave that for someone on staff to respond to at some point. Councillor Asmussen. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, Lanny, I, I like this idea. I think it opens up the interpretive information to our parks. I think a lot of people go through our parks on a daily basis, not knowing exactly the history, the wildlife, the information there. So I give staff credit for trying to think outside the box on this. And I think we're doing this trial for $3,500 coming out of your existing budget to try this and get it up there to make Monday Park, which is a highly visited area, a little more interactive with the people, uh, I think is a good idea. And I will uh, echo what uh, Councillor Nicholson pointed out earlier. I think it's more cost effective than having large information signs throughout the park with vandalism cleaning the cost to maintaining and replacing them. So I would, the cost of these tags to be replaced is, would be fairly minimal. Am I correct? You're talking, because 3500 probably the, is the cost to get everything in the labor set up, but actually replacing these QR tags is minimal in cost. Yeah, absolutely, and, this, and the QR tag signs are quite small and inexpensive. Yeah, so, no, I, I'm glad to see this. I'll be you know, supporting this recommendation going through, but I think it's a, a good job on staff, and I think it's, it's one more way of trying to open up some information using technology and staff being creative in that realm. So, thank you, good job. Councillor Hodge. Yeah, I think uh, I'm intrigued by this. Uh, I think it uh, certainly has some uh, some interesting opportunities. Um, um, I, I think that it allows us to get a lot of information out uh, quickly. Uh, it saves on on sign boards. Uh, uh, it's nice because we can update uh, information. Um, 
I don't know, I get, I'm assuming that we can uh, even uh, add video link as, as well. I know that uh, when I was president of the Heritage Society, we were talking about doing interpretive signs around the city, and rather than putting big signs that do get vandalized, just having links that when you click on them, you could actually hear a pioneer talking or somebody talking. So I think the ability to interface with video is really good. Um, they've been around for a while. Uh, I think Councillor Neil alluded to, you know, to varying degrees of success. Um, I personally use them during my election campaign. I use them with some of my material, and I, I uh, you know, I, I, I was still new then, and uh, so I'm, I'm interested to sort of see if this technology gets embraced. Have we? I know that uh, we're going to get the tour on Friday or on Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to going on the tour and, and trying this out. Uh, and I know that's when we go live. Have we tried this out? And I'm just curious, have we tried it out in the park? Uh, yeah, through the chair, absolutely. That was part of the it does, initial it does work. we did any work on this, made sure that actually in the forested area that... It does work. That the I was just going to say, because yeah. Mundy Park is notoriously one of the worst places in the city for cell phone signals. So uh, yeah. if it's improved there, but anybody who's tried to use a cell phone and drive along Como Lake Avenue by Charles Pass, that's a hole. So I, I, that would be the only glitch in this, is that we got it all up and that we didn't have a signal. So I'm glad that uh, that we, we with the technology isn't going to fail us at the hardware end, because I certainly think the uh, the software for this is, is, is just a, a great idea. Idea. And uh, you know, and I think it's it's uh, it's a reasonable amount to do a, a test with it, and uh, you know, and I look forward to if this is successful, looking at other areas, at other places in the city where we can use uh, use this as well. So uh, good on you for trying something new, and uh, and I look forward to uh, getting to try it on Wednesday. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Um, I wasn't being frivolous when I asked those questions because I pay staff here or I pay some consultant out of taxpayers' dollars to try and find out the state of the wildlife in our city. And if we have some little gadget, as I shall call it, that, and we have another two or 3,000 people walking through our forested areas and trails every day, um, and it's something that could be very quickly added onto your little list of questions, I, I think that's something worth looking at. I just don't... <laughs> It's great to know whether they like a yes or no or absolutely or somewhat, but I'd sure like to know about uh, some of the questions that we send staff out and pay staff or consultants to go out and find. So instead of just dismissing this as something frivolous, um, I would seriously, I will support this, but I seriously want uh, someone to look into this. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Ms. McKay. I think that's just the kind of uh, creative out of the box uh, thinking that we're all trying to do and trying to see how we can use new technology to uh, find smarter ways of, of doing the city's business. And of saving taxpayer dollars. Absolutely. And, and certainly our citizens are the eyes and ears um, for the, um, uh, the city, um, certainly. We've got thousands of people out there in the system every single day and we rely on them to be reporting damage, to be reporting uh, crime to be doing all kinds of things and I, I'm really intrigued with uh, the challenge that you've put before us and we will follow up with our experts in, in IT and in communications and see uh, what we can do with that idea. Okay, I'll look forward to hearing back from that. The one that was running through my mind, Mr. McIntyre, was QR tags on the, this property is the subject of a zoning application of science. Read the report right here find out what's happening in your neighborhood. Thank you. Can I have a motion to receive? So moved. Second. Councillor Asmundson, second by Councillor Hodge. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Carrie, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Item 4 is a report regarding the master trail plan update. We do have a presentation by our Director of Planning and Infrastructure. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, this presentation is with regards to the uh, report to Council before you. Um, certainly, I'm arriving late at the stage of this update, but uh, pleased to deliver this to Council. And uh, I should do that with acknowledgement to other departments. Although this project was led by Parks, Rec, and Culture, it certainly it, it didn't stand alone, so cert certainly we got substantial help from engineering department in regards to linking this with a strategic transportation plan and our community planning department as well to make sure that we were incorporated in community plans 
and as well as development in terms of facilitation and corporate communications to actually produce the document that's attached to uh, the staff report. So presentation outline, it's, it's really quite brief. I'll provide some uh, brief background, some project examples. Uh, there are lots out there, so we're only going to provide a few. And as was referenced earlier, councils uh, in, invited on a tour will be able to see uh, a few of these sites firsthand. So I think that's much better than any presentation that I could provide. So just, uh, just by way of quick update, this trail plan, the master trail plan is not new. It was endorsed by council some number of years ago. Um, this particular version has been updated, enhanced, expanded in a few areas. And that was based on feedback from previous councils. Uh, probably one of the things that I would highlight in this particular version is this. Now it's integrated with neighborhood plans, the strategic transportation plan, and, and importantly, uh, the financial plan. So while this presentation is going to focus briefly on the plan, there's still cause for celebration. The plan looks forward, but there's obviously uh, uh, existing infrastructure already built, already done, um, and already well received by the public. Uh, so there's nearly 100 kilometers of trails, and uh, just on this slide there's a few examples that uh, certainly are, are well known in the community. Um, it's been validated by citizens through Ipsos Reed polls that uh, people like trails. Uh, they're well used, uh, they're highly visible, uh, and highly valued, and certainly from my experience, I've been involved with trail development in other municipalities in the Lower Mainland, and it's certainly, uh, uh, from a, a, an amenity point of view, it's certainly one of those kinds of uh, amenities that certainly attracts people uh, uh, to move here, such as I did. So we're just going to go through uh, just a few examples. You'll see uh, it's it's quite an extensive network already, as we talked about, uh, near around 95 to 100 kilometers of trails already. Just to give you a bit of an idea, I'll just populate that map with some of the projects that are up there. So a couple of different kinds of examples. I mentioned the strategic transportation plan. So in the upper right-hand corner of that diagram talks about David Avenue. So that's not a parks, recreation, culture project. But it is one that integrates with the overall trail plan network. Uh, something towards the lower left, already looking at portions of the Fraser River Greenway, so for our riverfront experience. So the same kind of thing that you would see up in the northeast that we'll reference a little bit later. So some of those things are already going. Uh, or, and as well, there's some other examples of capital projects in Town Center and Monday Park. So there's a vast array already uh, that, that have, have been uh, put in place. So as mentioned in the staff report, the focus of this update included a look at a few specific things. So those are listed on the slide. And uh, that's that's really been the formation of the, the uh, update here and what's presented to council in its new form. So uh, significant focus on connectivity. Uh, that, that certainly has not changed. Hopefully this uh, squiggly map or, or diagram Jeez, <laughs> references that. So certainly it, it's a lot about connections. It's connections internally or locally, and it's connections regionally. So the focus is still that, uh, in, on that in regards to this master trail plan. So the plan itself is, is very much a long-term project, 10 to 20 years, and that's subject to how development goes. Um, so it certainly uh, certainly looks looks far ahead. As you see by the diagram, the, the dark blue represents some of the trail networks that are already there, and the, the other ones represent some potential trail links or special projects throughout. So it's a, it's a large community. It's a, it, this is just a very, uh, very quick overview. But the projects or the specific sites are going to be achieved through some capital works funded by DCCs. As noticed, as mentioned, there's over a period of time, a little over $12 million worth of DCCs generated to fund some acquisition, some development. But primarily it's developed by partnerships and, and through the development process. For example, on Council's agenda tonight, uh, you'll be considering for introduction, first reading, I believe, uh, uh, an application on Dayton Street. And that application includes a trail link. That's one of the factors that, that uh, helps build the trail incrementally. So 
So a different, uh, some of the specific examples, and we'll go through all 19. There's just a few to give a bit of an example. So this is a waterfront example uh, that talks about, so if you look at the map on the, on the upper right, it talks specifically about the Fraser River Greenway, and I won't get into detail, but uh, some of the uh, some of the images and the description on the lower left really talk about some of the, the, or express how this may look and what some of the objectives are in this particular area. The next one's a bit more of an urban example, uh, and that's, uh, and that is through an existing neighborhood. The map again is on the upper right, and some of the description of, of how it might look and some of the objectives are listed in the lower left. So, Again, a little bit more urban experience, but still a pedestrian corridor, helping link community uh, and providing uh, good access between public amenities. A uh, different project example is more of a natural experience. So that's Coquitlam, uh, Coquitlam River. Again, a map on the upper right, just uh, indicating some of the features. And the uh, pictures on the lower left and description talk about the objectives. And again, this is all uh, this is all identified in the master trail plan. So three other examples, different types of projects uh, there that demonstrate how the plan is integrated with others. The off-road off cycling, the uh, strategic transportation plan greenways, the, the uh, multi-use pathways or MUPs, and obviously connections to uh, an incoming uh, uh, urban transit system at the Evergreen, sta Evergreen Line stations. So within the overall plan, there's uh, there's uh, a variety of detail to ensure that that uh, that these objectives are met. And one of the areas of review certainly were uh, items of safety through SEPTED or um, protection through crime prevention through environmental design, the Bear Smart program that was referenced earlier today, and a variety of other things. So those those have been incorporated uh, into the uh, into the update. So the uh, work on the uh, trail management part of it has been enhanced uh, and it, some of the areas expanded to ensure that maintenance standards are met and protection of, of, of the assets. And obviously one of the main components was in looking at the implementation strategy, reducing costs by removing some redundancies. There were some duplications where trails and sidewalks were redundant, that, so it was felt there was paring back of the program a little bit to reduce the overall costs and they're looking at how development or other, or, or other means to provide the assets. Um, so that was a, a key part of the, the, the update. So none of these are cast in stone, but just uh, more, uh, more to give a bit of a, a glimpse as to what might be possible within the next few, five years. Um, I'd suggest that it, the plan provides a good framework, but it needs to be fluid to, to basically reflect opportunities as they come up. Um, capital works obviously in each year would be subject to council budget approval and then the developer projects would be su um, subject to development pace and developments that get approved from time to time so that's very much the incremental piece so some of the oh, sorry sector's not quite keeping pace um, so just a few projects that are either on the 2013 uh, project list, either approved or they're working, staff are working towards that would be presented to council. And these, the items on the left would be some of the capital works projects. The list on the right is a little bit different. They're projects in their own right. Uh, council will be familiar with the uh, trail guide. Um, I do understand our economic development office is looking at an update of that uh, in partnership with ourselves and corporate communication. That's not out yet, but that's certainly certainly being looked at, uh, certainly a substantial number of uh, community events along the trails used for a variety of things. So, uh, And uh, um, Council just had a conversation earlier about potential for interpretive walks, uh, however, those, however those may be provided. So again, those are non-capital related projects that would complement the trail network. So obviously, as it talks about in the staff report, this links back to a number of corporate strategic goals. 
And just in conclusion, on the last slide for today, the plan's long term, as I mentioned. It adds, it, it proposes to add somewhere in the range of 35 kilometers of new trails built on the same kind of premise as before, but hopefully uh, reduced in scale a little bit, uh, a little bit more practical or pragmatic. As I mentioned, still fluid to meet uh, emerging opportunities. Uh, the plan itself will need some refreshing. It needs to stay current with neighborhood plans as council adopts them, changes to the strategic transportation plan or changes to the financial plan, for example. Um, but as it's presented to you today, it's, uh, it provides a breadth of experience to citizens. Uh, it's connected and integrated. And uh, financially, uh, on an incremental basis, it's achievable. So um, as I mentioned, we have the tour on Wednesday, so hopefully we'll have an opportunity to have some conversations about things that council views that they, that they like or things that they believe should be changed. That's my presentation. Thank you. Is that a bicycle tour? <laughs> well, we're not going to quite cover 95 kilometers, and I've got, a lot of, I've, I've, got a lot, I've got a lot yet that I have not seen. Okay. Uh, Brent Craig and Lou. Well, it's, it's great to finally see this here. It's been a few years of um, traversing back and forth to council. Um, when I was on council my first term, I raised some of the issues that are now help reshape the trail plan, especially the privacy, the safety, the wildlife protection, connecting parks in a better way. And as you said, more strategically looking at trails, we had a lot of duplication in some areas of, of sidewalks, trails right beside. We also had some issues where going through a forested area where bears will use trails leading right into a school and we, you know, better thought patterns. So when I looked at the report that's finally come back to us and I went through it, I'm quite pleased with it. And I'm, I'm quite want to make sure, and I, you mentioned quite a number of times that the expectation of trails people are excited about, but there's fluidity to it. This isn't going to happen tomorrow. It may take 20 years or more for some pieces to actually fall into place. So it, it's a living document that is going to take time to connect. But I, when I went through it and I look at the thought of what's been refined into this document, I'm pleased with it. I want to say thank you to staff for because I had a lot of concerns and I think staff with our Ms. McKay and everything saw that reaction and said, yeah, there are some issues with the previous plan that needed to be better focused to be more financially achievable than it is now. And I think that's what we all want. We want it whether we don't want to have something that's so far out there that we will never get to. So we have that now. My one concern is Metro. And we've heard about Metro Parks, their financial abilities of late, and their suggestion of even asking municipalities to take over parks has come out of that area. And that's an ongoing discussion that Metro directors are going to have. I guess my one concern is, is how does that affect our ability moving forward in the future with the trails, whether we connect through or metro trails? So that's a concern within your trail plan, and how are we going to address that? Uh, through the chair, um, certainly the, uh, the, the recent discussions about uh, metro's consideration of turning some parks over to municipality has has a number of challenges and probably a number of opportunities, perhaps. But um, I, yeah. that hasn't certainly been reflected in the current plan. Obviously, if there were a substantial change to the regional network, uh, that's something we'd have that we would certainly have to address. Uh, my expectation is the metro parks won't disappear as destination sites. I would expect they'd still be in the region, and if that's the case, the network. The validity of the network and the desire for people to get there and be connected would still be there. I guess my concern is cost to the city. Are we going to wind up picking up the cost to make these connections? We talk about in Colony Farm Sheep Paddock Trail that hasn't been done. Metro, when you talk about the Fraser River Greenway, well, it's a great vision, but probably the most expensive piece to acquire. I think we had a, a a report to council a year and a half ago about the land cost down there would be about $20 million to the city's cost for that. So I would like you guys to take a, a strong look at those impl implications to our trail network plan and how to protect the city's interests 
in that regard moving forward with Metro and what's happening with Metro? Because we've known for a long time that Metro, since I was, you know, previous president of the Burke Mountain Resident Association, we've had meetings with Minicata, and Craig can talk about this, trying to get funding out at Minicata that we haven't been able to get for upgrades out there. Metro's always had a greater dreams and visions that they've ever had funding. It's kind of nice to see that Metro's now sort of realizing the financial realities of what they're get, trying to get themselves into. So, thank you. Thank you. I think it's important, though, to acknowledge that I, I heard clearly from Kurt this is the plan that we have today, and it's the plan that will have to be modified as the times change. That's one of the changes that we can see on the horizon. Oh, it's one of the changes. Lord knows there are others. How do we deal with it? Great. Thanks. Great. Yeah, I'm, I was happy to see the report. Um, I think that uh, a couple of things that strike me is that uh, the, the ability to start interconnecting the trails, and I realize it's not going to happen right away, but to me that's the big thing is that you can actually get on trails and go places, and that we're going to be able to interconnect neighborhoods, and that uh, in the past we've had sort of sections of trails, and I, you know, I, I was happy to see that, that map. Uh, there's still a lot of green lines that still need to be filled in, but I think the important thing is we have a plan. And I think having a plan in place means that there will be less potential for duplication where we find out we've got trails that are just half a block from a, a walkway or a sidewalk that's doing the same thing. So uh, I think now that we, ha that we have an overview plan and that we're integrating this plan with neighborhood plans and, and traffic plans and road patterns and everything, I think that's the key to this. One of the things that also strikes me on this is that um, in addition to the uh, the connectivity that goes on to this is trails for specific purposes. And, uh, you know, we, we acknowledge the crunch where people go there because they want a hiking experience. But I also think that there's a lot of people who go and they want a biking experience, not just a ride around the, the city. I know Councillor O'Neill was telling us earlier about his, you know, uh, travels on the day, and I think that's great, and I try to get out in them as well. But I'm hearing more and more people saying that they want mountain biking. They want a place where they can go and ride and do a circle up on the side of a hill or something. In my travels on Burke Mountain, and I get up on the trails quite a bit, walk with the family, and we get off the beaten track. And I've twice now stumbled across mountain bike trails where kids have built ramps and jumps, and one day they were all out there with shovels, and they know that they're on private land. And their big concern is what's going to happen? We're going to lose some of our best trail networks up on Burke Mountain. Uh, to, to development, and is, are those opportunities going to be replaced in hopes by the very same development that's possibly um, over overtaking them? I, I recognize here that in on our section 19 here, you do mention and address that in terms of the Eagle Mountain Trail Network area and also in the Coquitlam River Trail Network area, but I also notice that it says potential facilities may be located, and I realize that we're going to have to do some work in nailing these down. What I like about the master trail plan is we've got a plan. We see where the pieces are. We see where those lines are going to be filling them in. But we don't see where these opportunities are. We have some identity sites identified, but I'd really like to see us push ahead and actually try to identify some potential sites, either because of topography or because of where um, you know, the population is. So I, I would really like to see some, some specialized trails uh, developed, in particular in the area, area of uh, off-road uh, biking. So other than that, I thought it was uh, great, and, uh, and again, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out and seeing some, uh, some more trails, and hopefully we'll get to see some new ones on, uh, on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Lou. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you said that we're the next five years. What's the program as far as financial is concerned for the, the next five years that you have in mind? Roughly. Uh, your your Worship, through the Chair, um, the, the trail budget specifically for uh, for the trail program hasn't been defined for the next five years. Uh, it has for a couple, uh, so I think about $250,000 this year for the uh, Coquitlam Crunch. I think with, uh, with the plan in place, it'll provide an opportunity for staff to bring to Council a capital program that you could consider before development happens. So there's no there's no long-term commitment specifically out of general so revenue the, funded so capital. The parks have not thought about what is it going to cost us on a yearly basis from year to year 20. What is it going to cost <coughs> to develop these trails? Are we 25% built out 
50 percent, 75? What is it? How many? Through, through the chair, perhaps I could answer it this way. The program, uh, the program as identified today, uh, suggests the need for about $12 million in development cost charge funds to both acquire land and develop trails. So that would be over a 10 to, that would be over likely a 20 year period. So as far as that goes, that That's would be the final dollars. That would be today's dollars. Okay. Uh, have you ever checked into federal government money for your trails? Because I remember when I was a member of Parliament, I brought a lot of money to possible equipment for trails. And certainly money in the infrastructure, money for trails. Sure. Any time there would be an opportunity to uh, to uh, capitalize on on funding, and there is reference to partnerships that could be public sector, private sector, not for profits to maximize uh, the city's investment. We staff would look at that absolutely. And it might be wise to write a letter to the federal government to ask them when is next program coming forward? Is there program now? Because obviously, you know, when I was a member of Parliament, what used to happen. They said, you give all the money to Quebec. You give all the money to everybody else. Well, you know why? Because Quebec had a book on where the infrastructure money goes, and they're really up fast, up front, and applying for it. So I said that to the people, well, <coughs> how are you going to get the money if you apply for it? Well, BC doesn't have that book. You can get it from the federal government. Uh, of a book that will tell you a free to check the money, you know, for different programs. And you have to be adopted, and they'll get the money as fast as we apply for it, but if you don't know about it and don't apply for it, you're not going to get it. So, you know, the Quebec is very good at it. I mean, I'll tell you, they must have an army full of people just in their places looking for these kind of things, okay? The one thing I'm also concerned about is the residents used to say, you put a trail back in my yard, I'm going to be broken into. Or I'm barbecuing in my backyard, and there's people jogging by my their backyard and stopping. You know, these are the things you get comments on. I hope that you try to stay away, away from the residential backyards as possible. Through the chair, um, that was one of the comments that had come up, and it was one of the things reviewed. There is a reference in the staff report when that was studied with the RCMP. In fact, anecdotally, um, it suggests that where there are trails, there's less crimes, not more crimes. So, uh, and that's not a phenomenon with Coquitlam that tends to be a standard. More eyes, not just out on the street, but more eyes mm -hmm. in the neighborhood on trails. So, uh, yeah. and, and as far as Metro is concerned, wanting to get rid of their parks, it's music to my ears. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. We should be taking over those parks, you know. So then maybe the Metro will, and, 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 and they should sell their housing, and then they should come down to where they used to be in sewer and water. And, you know, that, that that's their mandate, that it should be. And maybe get rid of all that big bureaucracy and those and those huge bills that we get from Metro Vancouver on a yearly basis for taxes. You know, I, I think it would be great to do that. Maybe you're in the house, maybe you can suggest that they get rid of the housing. Can, I can uh, suggest there's things they should get rid of, but it wouldn't be housing. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, BC Housing, I remember when I was a president of the <coughs> community housing, the, the BC Housing came over and they wanted to buy it. You know, and then we had a minister from the previous government that came to me and said, Oh, we'll take over your alien housing. Yeah. How much? Oh, well, I thought you're going to give it to us for free. Uh, it's worth about 80 odd million dollars for free. But, anyways, because I noticed that we're subsidizing every department in Metro Vancouver. And we got rid of those two functions. I think the taxpayers in this community and the other community would be better off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Thank you. A couple of things. The first thing to me from of course, the tourism thing that I keep mentioning, and hopefully you guys are all waiting for bated breath for it to come through. Um, but hopefully, um, the first thing on the budget would be the connectivity of the trails so that we can make what we've got useful and use our money that we've got to, um, to do that so that we can sort of complete things that might be, that we can use to bring folks here and, and uh, then get busy on other things. And I'm sorry if Council Robinson isn't here right now because she's really busy on the Parks Committee at Metro, but we did have um, a discussion on Friday about the parks. There isn't much appetite around the board at all to be getting rid of Metro parks. There just isn't. And um, uh, Mayor Corrigan from Burnaby spoke that, 
you know, he's really proud of all the parks that he's, you know, been involved with over the years, bringing them into the metro fold. And the city of Langley, which is another high growth city like we are, figures that, I mean, they'd be $14 million in the hole every year if they had to look at a lot of the parks that they've got out there. So really, when you look around the region, uh, and there was others that spoke, but those two stuck out because they were close to us, there really isn't much of an appetite to be doing that. But what there is an appetite for is that they did just what you've done with our trails, that let's get a whole map and let's, for once in many years, sit down and try and look at the parts that were not connected or that we could, uh, instead of maybe spending a million dollars in one spot, maybe do some things of maybe connectivity or some little things that could make the parks more attractive. And uh, the biggest thing, of course, is Belcara Park right now, just making sure that it gets ship shape and that we can get our, an extension of the lease or an outright purchase. Um, that's about it. But uh, I don't foresee us having to uh, buy up our parks quickly because there wouldn't be many buyers out there. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Terry? Yes, I wonder, uh, are we familiar with the National Trails Coalition? And um, I, I think through this federal federally sanctioned organization there are funding opportunities as Councillor Sikora um, mentioned um, but it's the major federal body that seeks to disperse funds all across Canada to enhance the trail network so are we familiar with that and through the chair I'm not familiar with that specific organization uh, I'll ask Ms. McKay if she's got comments to make and I do have a comment to make about the budget and how we would capitalize on such entity oh sorry uh, not much much to add we're certainly aware of the National Trails Coalition as well as other uh, organizations that are around that have do have resources that uh, uh, are very helpful for professionals that are managing trail systems uh, as well as uh, um, as resources. Thank you, Kurt. And, um, yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, so I mentioned that because uh, in support of this idea of moving forward on the uh, on the development of our trail system and the connectivity, as everybody said, uh, I think it's a wonderful. And I've been using the trails around here as a as a bike rider for a long time. Um, um, uh, as many uh, the Poco Trail primarily, but part of the Poco Trail. You can go off to the De Bouville Slough Loop, and part of that loop is in Coquitlam, and uh, that's the part that I rode yesterday, as a matter of fact. And it was quite delightful, and lots of people on there walking and biking. And, and uh, dogs. And, and, and I was happy to report well, that almost all of the dogs were on leash yesterday, and quite often they're not. Um, but yesterday, there a lot of them were on leash, and, and most of the dog owners, if I tinkled the little bell uh, well enough in advance, they got their dogs under control, moved to the side. So it was probably one of the best experiences that I've had in a long time So, with responsible dog owners there. Um, so all working together, we can uh, sing happy trails to you going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Matter of fact, the, the federal government years ago wanted a trail built right across Canada. So they're, they're in for the money. There's no two ways about it. And when I said I gave money to uh, Fort Coquitlam also went to West Vancouver and gave them a bunch of money for trails. So there was a, that year, I went to many, many places and gave money for, for trails. So I'm sure that they have money even today in the infrastructure, uh, money for park trails. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Only if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm fine. We, we obviously, the Trans Canada Trail does run through Coquitlam, and yeah. I've been fortunate enough to work in three municipalities. All, the trail runs through all three of them, so as well as uh, linked to Trails BC. So unfortunately, it's not well funded by the federal government. It's a federal initiative, but really, it's it's yeah. funded by locals, and that's how the trail gets built we across Canada. We need to change so. the government. Yeah, we do. <laughs> the local group is very active. Um, for the very first thing I did as an acting mayor at being elected to council was go over here and meet. The Trans Canada Trails group as they came through the park and welcomed them to Coquitlam. It was kind of fun. Recognize some of them. Oh, could I have a motion to receive? So moved. Second. Oh. Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? 
Gary, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Five is a report regarding 2012 park project update. The recommendations that the committee receive the report for information. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Edmondson. Second by yeah. Councillor Hodge. Second. Very much. All in favor. Completes the reports from Leisure and Parks for today. Very good. Gee, they haven't been busy at all. Okay, so the weather's nice out there. So perfect. Perfect timing. report regarding options for information signage in newly developing oh. neighborhoods of Burke yeah. Mountain. We have introductory comments by our general manager of planning and development. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council members. I was listening with one ear about the QR codes. I, I learned a lot there, <laughs> and I can see this application on our slide too. So it's a good sufficient I, I see you've learned who to talk to too. <laughs> Um, actually, I, I want to start by uh, acknowledging uh, in this effort uh, uh, the help and input from um, staff and other areas. Certainly, uh, uh, Dan uh, McDonald, our communications manager, really uh, assisted, as did the other Dan, Dan Mooney. There he is. Because um, we wanted to make sure we touched base with our uh, operations uh, colleagues, because uh, depending on the direction that we go with this signage program um, and Council's uh, direction, um, it may be enlisting the assistance from operations staff. So, um, this report was prepared in uh, response to a request from Council uh, looking at um, uh, providing additional information signage to residents, uh, particularly in, in newly developing neighborhoods. Um, uh, people move in, they don't realize that the, the temporary dead end at the end of the street and all those trees beyond there, no, that's not a park or green space. It's, in fact, planned for something else. And uh, the thought had been we could maybe do a little better job in uh, providing information so to give people a heads up of what's planned for you know, in future years. So there was, I guess, it was a concern that it was inadequate information signage for the public and residents, and, and particularly in newly developing neighborhoods. Um, now, I mean, it's mentioned in the report, but I just did want to emphasize uh, there are also other signage, development signage related initiatives underway currently, and we, uh, we, we talked with those staff as well. Um, the mayor had a request to, uh, for us to update and improve on our public hearing signage, which tends to be a little bit stuffy in legalese. Um, and as well, there is a, um, a thought around, uh, and this is more a response to some um, requests and some criticisms from the development community about directional signage to their development sites. And uh, the council member recall there was a bit of an issue there a while back where in, in the absence of direction, it was uh, a real problem. And so we are working on both of those. And so, um, and this was, we, we felt we'd deal with this and bring this forward separately, but not ignoring those other initiatives. Um, <clears throat> what we've done with the, uh, um, this particular, uh, Signage question is we uh, we got some help and um, looked around what other municipalities have have, uh, have done in the Lower Mainland. Uh, I'm familiar with some of Port Moody's efforts over the years. Uh, we, we cite that as an example, but we also want to check outside. We went to uh, Calgary and Edmonton um, and physically go, but went to check with them to see what sort of uh, information signage they have. So through that review and, and the, the staff discussions, we thought um, we. we arrived at sort of three options, sort of three levels of signage, if you will, to, uh, to tackle this, uh, this area. And they're, they're, they're set out in the report um, along with uh, the, uh, the costing estimates for uh, the upfront installation. Did you speak uh, The upfront installation and then the, uh, the ongoing uh, operating costs and potential costs for relocating signage over time. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that on page five of the report. Um, we'll bring this forward for council for uh, initial discussion and, and some feedback to staff. Uh, if there's direction today, that's that's great. Um, and, and depending on that direction, we either come back with this alone with further detail and to advance that program, or and perhaps this may be more appropriate, uh, 
dealing with it in uh, uh, coordination with the development directional signage initiative. And that's what I think we would, if we had a recommendation, that's where we would go. But uh, we want to bring this forward down, give you something to look at, something to discuss, and get some feedback to us. Dan, anything you want to add? Uh, just that I've also been contacted by certain representatives from the development community saying, you know, can we joint venture? Can we do something that shows us in a better light, shows the city in a better light? So just very, very briefly, I'd suggest there's some pent-up um, demands out there that people want to make this better and improve upon. So the time has come. I guess. Rick? Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, for this report. It's an issue that I raised and was directed to staff to go and come back with recommendations on it because it has been an issue in the Northeast but throughout the city with development and ongoing issues and trying to make the public better aware of what's happening in their city or around them so they, they're not. And I, I like the three levels that you're doing here. I did think that when I read the report and I, I looked at it that you were going to be using QR codes to those tags on the signs to easily access the information. The website's there, but I think those would be another thing to tag on to there. My other comment would be that, and I, I agree with you, we don't want these big type of signs. We want smaller signs. I think we want signs with the basic information because when you put up like this one with this major when development changes, you don't want people to think that this is a static issue because it's a fluid issue. So when you look at the street layout, maybe the, the green space layouts, which are pretty static, but the other part of it, please refer to this, which will bring up better mapping, better information for the people when they, they get up there. Um, I would encourage you to that partnership with the development community about working together for helping us save costs. But also, we do have an issue that's been up in the Northeast with the proliferation of developer signs, sandwich board signs, uh, it's a pain to the people living up there because they're all over the place, they're in the way. And so if we can get that better coordination, clean up the area, but still have it so the signage directs people to where the developments are, um, it would be greatly appreciated. So I, I'm glad to hear that you've had those discussions and there's a, a willingness to cooperate on that one. I think that could be quite beneficial to us. When we talk about science, I think, though, that certain areas you, you want to have a static sign explaining what it is. And I think Craig mentioned this earlier. When we have a park site, this is going to be an active park site, not a passive park site. So when people move in, it's not like Queens and Park, some people are going, well, I don't want that. Well, no, it's been on the map. But it's a signs both sides saying, this is future active park site. Trails, just read the report, it's always good to be future trail connection here. Um, those type of things are some of the issues, um, commercial sites or school sites. You know, we, we've had some issues where people have bought and schools starting to go in in different areas and people are, but some of those key type of issues that people get, I think Craig and I can talk, those are, I'm trying to think some of the main areas that we get comments on. Yep. So while we have those informations on the roadways and key areas and development information, I think the key areas is where active parks are going or, or it's a passive park, where's my trail coming beside me. Those type of things need some small signage to say, hey, so people can point and say, well, no, it's there, it's been signed, and people are better aware of it. And about the, um, I like the idea of the, the road ends, about a road connecting through. We had a person who bought on Gislayson, who thought Gislayson was a, a dead-end street, not a, a collector road right into the village core. And so I think, well, at, it'd be nice to have a, tra a sign at the trail end. It'd also have a good sign at the beginning of the roadway to stating, you know, this is now going to be a future three-lane, four-lane arterial collector type of roads. So when people are entering, they see that information also. But I want to thank staff. I like the report. Um, there's a bit of cost, but I think you could maybe reduce the cost this significantly by partnering with the developers. And so I, I encourage you to go that route. But it's 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 addressed most of the concerns that I had, and I'm quite sure Craig has got some other comments. But I think it'll go a long way. 
and helping and throughout the city because we're you know town center for Quitlam, all these areas are going to be feeling the same thing so the better information and the qr code tags they just easier access for people for information thank you i'm done thank you terry yes thank you um uh, my, the number one reaction that I had to this was, um, but it was dealt with orally here, was the need to uh, partner with the development community because they've been asking for the right to have directional signage, especially up in Burke Mountain where even Google Maps isn't up to date on the streets that are up there and people have a real hard time finding their way. I don't know what the excuse would be for the developer who has a, a series of signs this morning going all the way up. Um, all the way up uh, Blue Mountain Road from Brunette to Austin, uh, pointing to a development that's actually to the east on Brunette. Um, <laughs> the staff, somebody should go out and look at it. Um, I, I'm not going to embarrass the developer here today, um, but it was kind of bizarre. Well, the developer is here today? No, I, <laughs> I don't think so, no. Uh, it's, it's a bizarre, a whole bunch of those little lawn signs, like election signs, pointing all the way up to Austin when the development is actually to the east, so uh, along Brunette, uh, proposed development. Kind of weird. Anyway, so I, I really do think that um, if somehow we can combine, uh, it would certainly help our um, capital cost combining um, our signage with, uh, with locators for developments. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and like uh, Brent, I, I want to second, uh, th this isn't just Burke Mountain. Um, I, I was at a uh, sort of a an open house that a developer had uh, for the area just south of David and just um, just east of Pipeline and um, that, that was talking about a development that was going to basically go uh, allow the connection of Gabriola mm -hmm. from Gabriola one end stops another end stops there and dotted lines there and there was somebody who lives right beside uh, where that development is going to go in who, who thought he was uh, you know, going to be in parkland there, didn't know that's a development area. So a little signage there, even just a little Q code. It doesn't have to be a lot, so um, QR code, rather. So thank you. That's it. Thank you, May. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd probably look at this in a different way as usual. But I think that we miss some opportunities, especially in Burke Mountain, where uh, Jim and his department and with yourself, Dan, have put out maps that could be sent out with tax notices just neighborhood by neighborhood. And I think that we're at the stage, for instance, in Millardville right now, where we could be um, sending out your update, or 2013 update, um, and maybe just showing where some of our housing choices have um, just taken, you know, just put it in orange or something with a little note like you do on your maps and say, um, developed under new housing choices and then your little tags that people could go on and figure out you know what what the housing choices is but only send that to the Millardville neighborhood and the same as Austin and especially Burt Mountain now what's happening a lot in Burt Mountain is a lot of the um, real estate agents that go up there are pretty familiar with Burt Mountain but not always always familiar with Burt Mountain and all the stuff that's going on up there so I think that we should be using our tax notices also to send out an updated map about how far along we are and perhaps you could even um, put circles around areas uh, 2014 or beyond, do you know what I mean? Just so you can't promise dates, but so people will have an idea of what's next. And when we do get a map that you're saying, suggesting that you're going to do, run off paper copies of it and make sure the development community gets them to put them up in their site offices. And that would alleviate a whole bunch of misinformation. And I don't believe that the people in the site offices are trying to give out misinformation, but it's sure easy up there to do that. And the important things that I get back is, what's a busy road? What's a collector road? What's a park? What kind of park? Is it active or passive? I think as other people have mentioned. So th the information that people are looking for would be readily available, not just from a map, but from a copy of that map going to all the different site offices. And maybe we don't have that many real estate offices either, and we could uh, give one you, you present to our association every year. And maybe the um, 
we could just let people know that the maps are available here for 10 or 20 bucks or whatever, and people would start putting them up in their offices. So we have the information. It's just how to um, get it out there. I think if I were paying taxes and I was living in an area like Burke Mountain and I received a notice that said, here's, here's your map, this is what's going on this year, you know, or what we hope to accomplish this year, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Lou? Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Let Lou, me... excuse me. Go ahead. I misread my list. Of That's right. Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, and, and Brett covered off a lot of what I have to say because he's, he's living the same thing on a daily basis that I am and, uh, and, and we hear from residents and, and one of the things that we hear most often from residents is that I didn't know this or what is this exactly um, and, and, and he's right the, the issue of the park I was surprised when I went to the uh, opening or the uh, public uh, open house for Queenston Park how many people had a different vision of what they thought a park was that uh, you know, some said, you mean there's going to be kids playing next to my house? And that was literally one of the questions that yeah, they, they thought that they were, they thought that they were getting a nature park up in an area where we're leaving all these wide swaths of, uh, you know, of, of uh, reserves around creeks. So, so they were, they were really quite concerned that they had been not given the proper information about what was next to their, to their home. And I think we have two issues. I think people want to know how the community is developing, but they also want to know what's in their backyard. And they want to know if, if that bush behind them is going to be a trail, if it is going to be Passive Park. Um, you know, if, if the school, and, and I know it's very difficult to give, uh, give specifics, but people want to know particularly what's going to be right next to them. Um, one of the things that I've talked to engineering about, and I think we've, we've been planning, right, we've done a, a better job on, is getting the signs out about even things like parking. Which side of the street is going to be no parking? Is it going to be no parking? Uh, I hear from people who move in and they say, I bought this house and the street was wide open and then two days after I move in, suddenly I find out there's only parking on one side of the street. So they want to know early. Um, things like collector roads. Uh, I remember the day when we used to have up on Mariner signs that said future collector road or collector road. And I think we have to determine. It's one thing to see that there's a sign there. It's another thing they want to know, is it a collector road? And at the end of the roads, saying this, this road is going to go through. Um, Gabriola, the Councillor Neil mentioned, is a good one. The other one is the top of Oxford Street. Yes. And there is no sign at the top of Oxford Street. It's a trail, but there's nothing there to indicate that that's the plan of a future connector there. My mother's still pissed off. She thinks Thermal Drive is going to be a dead end street. Uh, <laughs> you know, so you know, so this isn't a new, isn't a new thing. But realtors either have don't have all the full information, and and it surprises me how many people don't read or see their, their, uh, their community plan, the, the OCP, when they go to purchase a home. And so I think the best thing that we can do is to try to put as much information out into the community. I think signage, uh, on-location signage is a great way to do that. I think the, the opportunity to partner with developers makes sense because I think it's in their interest as well to get that information out to buyers as to what's going to happen in the community. I think we, we often talk about this as well, we have to prepare people. It's not also just letting them know that this road is going to be this. It's also an opportunity to let people know the good news about what is happening in the community. That road that's going to go through, that school that's going to be there, that fire hall that we're building. And, and I think that we also have to talk about coming soon to your neighborhood. And uh, you know, The provincial government does it. And those are signs all up and down the SkyTrain route about the SkyTrain. But I think that we also have to talk about what we as a city are doing and why, why we're putting this big pipe through this area that this is what this pipe does. And it may be just as simple as simple as having that QR code there so if people really want to know all about why we're doing that, that they can get the information that we can't just put on a sign. But I, I think signs come in different sizes. They don't all have to be the big four by eight boards, but just something that's small enough with that QR code or something that directs people so they can get the information that they need that they can that they need and they, they can get it to get it quickly and and I think at this point more information is better than lack of information because I think then that people make a better informed decision about where they want to buy and also I think that we as a city and we as council get fewer surprises down the road if people are informed up, up front um, again uh, like Councillor Asmussen has mentioned that you know all the development signs up on, on Burke Mountain you go up there on a Saturday the signs are all pointing different directions there's 
balloons all flying off of them and they're and they're and they're all over the place and I would really rather just see some sort of a coordinated effort that just says you know foothills development here this and, and find a spot where we can you know for a couple of years just have the board placement one of the challenges that we're going to have up there is that Westville has closed down the interpretation their information center the building has just gone a lot of people went there to get this information uh, and I don't know if that information will be, if there'll be sign boards there or pick up boards for things, but you know, that was, that was the first point of contact. And, and, and I appreciate why that's coming down, but I think people still need a place where they can get that information, know where the, where the, uh, the developments are. And uh, again, just uh, getting more information in advance is what I'm looking for. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Scott. Thank you. Uh, how many of these signs do you foresee in the city? There are. Uh, Jim has some <clears throat> yeah, under the, the three different options, we, we made some assumptions. We set that out in the table. And um, under each of the assumptions, it was uh, assumed to be four of these four by six sort of neighborhood big picture signs, mm -hmm. it's sort of an entry point to a neighborhood. So we four of those. And then we had to make some assumptions about the number of smaller signs. And under one scenario, there wouldn't be the road end signs, so there was none. The second was um, just at road ends. And then the third was uh, uh, road ends plus other sites. And so there would be, it was estimated to be 20. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so how much would it cost to, uh, the cost of these signs? I notice you got it here. Are these the real true costs? Those are our preliminary uh, best guess estimates. We did check the corporate communications and with our operations people just to make sure we're in, in the ball, ballpark. What about maintenance? Uh, and as well in that table, it identifies, uh, it breaks out between annual maintenance uh, for cleaning, re you know, repairing, and the like. Um, and, and there's a, a sort of a, uh, a bulk rate quoted there, $25 yeah, per small yeah. sign, 250 for the, the large ones, and then the cost of relocating as well. And that was all provided by operations. And what I'm asking, I'm concerned about graffiti and other things happening. And, and, and that's why I'd suggest in this, and we did talk to uh, various people about this, making sure that this, this has a template, making sure it has almost like a branding or one, so we're not doing custom signs, because as you know, if you start getting into custom signs in various locations, price just grows exponentially. So at the end of the day, I would hope to see a lot of these what I would say branded so that we this is where the logo goes of the city this is where the information goes this is where the developers information goes and, and it's consistent right along the line so if someone kicks it in or sprays it or destroys it or burns it or whatever they, they do um, there's a template there and you replace it with a template you're not doing custom design work or you could have a glass in front of it you know. yeah whatever uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the sign experts certainly there are some resilient materials out there these days that A, do a lot to block paint, and B, do an awful lot to block uh, people's feet and various other yeah. weapons they yeah. use. And this one, just uh, for a comment, the fact is you go up Marmont Avenue from Brunette, Woods Austin Avenue, the sign reads, Blue Mountain Park for sale. Four or five of those signs along there. And I'm, I'm wondering if somebody's selling some condominiums up there, or what it is. But you see those signs on the right hand side, uh, three or four of them, maybe five, of a Blue Mountain Park for sale. And uh, it, 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 me, it, it, you know, drew my attention to it in a hurry. But it's been there for about a week or more. Oh, Lori uh, selling Blue Mountain Park, I heard. <laughs> and I'm wondering what it is. Anyways, thank you very much. Budget deficit. <laughs> Step one. Uh, one of the things uh, we're uh, we're hoping to get a little bit of feedback. We've got some good general feedback, but in terms of the, the level of effort, uh, we will be taking this effort, finalizing a plan, and putting in uh, a bunch of presentations with that kind of stuff. But to help us to narrow down, we put in the three levels. Uh, do you want us to start really basic, or do you want us to uh, shoot for more signs, that kind of stuff? We've more. defined it as a more one, two, and more, more, more is better right more now. Better. That's what I was yeah. sort of like generally yeah. getting at here, but I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, with partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you got enough direction on that goal? Yes. And okay, okay. just can I ask one question? Oh, so when me. you do these, can can you do the paper ones that I was talking about? 
Uh, for the inserts? No, for the oh. site offices, for the different developers. Yeah, I, I, I see that there was a number of uh, you know, really good uh, suggestions made here, and some of it's focused more on science. Others are other means, other avenues of communication, including getting copies of plans out to realtors and developers so they can display but it. But site offices, Jim, yeah. then, then when people yeah. are in there, they can't be told that, oh, no, there's a creek here, You're, no one will ever build when they see road, you know. If we get the, if we get the maps, uh, the printing's not a problem from this perspective at all. Yeah. Turn out some pretty high, high-end maps. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think the, the conclusion seems to be that the, the more information, the better. Mm -hmm. The less Especially cost, there. the better. And the, the sooner, the better. Yes. But I would just comment on right Craig, Craig, Craig's comment about uh, all the signs going up already for SkyTrain. Well, uh, I'm sure the provincial government's glad they didn't put them up 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> when they might have. Motion to receive. Oh, move. Second. Motion to adjourn. We have no way at one more item. We have vote on it? Yeah, well, let's vote on the motion first. All in favor? Aye. Jerry, thank you very much. I think we have one other business item. I'm Charles Best, uh, uh, Field. He did some repairs. Was it a major repair? Or? Um, I could just get the mic, the mic back. back. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes, that would be considered a major repair. So when are you, when are you going to put the new turf on there? We expect with this repair we'll get another two to four years of wear out of the existing uh, carpet. Yeah, so by that time you're also going to renegotiate the contract, right, with the school? Ideally we'll renegotiate the contract well in advance of the carpet being uh, uh, repaired. Uh, it's actually been flagged as a, an item for discussion with the school board both on the work plan for our staff as well as school board staff to um, enter into um, discussions regarding the joint operating agreement. And so that would cover all of our shared uh, sites uh, throughout the, the city. So we're hopeful that those discussions will start in September of this year. It may take some time. It's a complicated uh, relationship that's gone on for many years. Uh, but we want to start this year and we'll go um, until it's done, hopefully. And hopefully that's well in advance of the, uh, the four year. Okay, Mark. thank you. Thank you. See Maybe. anything further? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Councillor Sikora, seconded by Councillor Asmussen. Anybody? Right. We're good. All in favor? Thank you. Anybody need a second?